Hello, everyone. This is Space Cafe Podcast, and I'm Marcus. So, I was waiting for the guest of this episode to arrive at our recording location, the eighth floor of a WeWork co-working space in Austin, Texas. My guest texts me that she'll be 10 minutes late. Take your time, I text her back. My gear is set up and I have some time to kill, so I grab a cup of coffee. A couple of minutes later, I hear the elevator door open. My guest greets me with a big smile and introduces me to a second person I wasn't expecting, at least not this time. Matt, a friend, she says. Five minutes later, the truth is revealed. Matt is a Green Beret, a Special Forces guy. Hmm. I believe my guest was simply trying to ensure that during her appointment with me on the 8th floor in that American city where only those who conceal their weapons rather than displaying them openly are subject to strict law enforcement, she would be met on friendly terms. I assured her that being European, I would come unarmed, leaving both my real and metaphorical weapons under the table. Shauna Pandya is such a treat, such a delight. A true chill of all trades. Thank you wow. so much. That was fun. Dr. Shauna Pandya is a scientist astronaut candidate with Project Possum, physician, aquanaut, speaker, martial artist. She wouldn't have needed a Green Beret. Advanced diver, skydiver, pilot in training, and a fellow of the Explorers Club. To be honest, I see my own life spiraling out of control into the vastness of empty space and nothingness in the face of all this. Anyhow, we covered lots of topics. Sex in space, the secrets behind great leadership, space medicine, the challenges of long duration space travel, and the ethical implications of human reproduction in space. There are just some of many topics we touch upon in this episode, and boy, did I enjoy that conversation. Off you go. Enjoy. Our second station was a unwinterized tent in the middle of the Utah desert in wow. January. Wow. Yeah, some... sir. We had some really good people on that mission, ones that we're friends with to this day. Um, that's where, you know, uh, you know, there were, it, it was two weeks, but honestly, the lessons that we learned could fill a book. After we escaped from Mars, like we were set free from this, this, habitat where we were confined together for two weeks. Um, a day after that, we willingly, the four of us, went into an escape room in Grand Junction and, uh, you know, willingly went into isolation confinement again together. Wow. <laughs> and we, we won the escape room. But it was, you know, that's that's the kind of bonds you forge with Wonderful. the right crew. Yeah. Super. Let's jump right let's, in. Yeah, let's okay? jump into it. Let's do it. Super. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time in the first place. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. So we were, um, I was going to talk about sex in space, but you just told us that beautiful story of yours when you were doing that simulation in the desert. Yeah. So how, how is that? What does it feel like? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. So did everyone come out alive or did you have bodies to leave behind? I mean, as the official record is, we didn't leave anyone behind <laughs> that we're willing to say publicly. <laughs> no, I joke. Um, that was my third expedition in an analog or analogous to space-like environment at that point. Um, so I had done a previous rotation at the Mars Desert Research Station as a medical officer. Mm -hmm. um, I had been on an underwater aquanaut mission, uh, again, as a medical officer. And this is the first time I stepped in as a commander. Um, this was a two-week sojourn. And there's just so many lessons learned. Um, it was It was incredible. Hmm. Um, it was challenging when you make mistakes as a leader, and you will. Um, they're on full display for everyone to see, and it's kind of how you how you admit to those, how you um, make a plan to not do that again. Um, that kind of helps you be better the next time. How do you get yourself to be accepted as a leader? Do, you, do people just subordinate themselves, or would they challenge you also? People will challenge you. 
And so what was really cool on that mission um, is that, you know, it was my first time as a commander and we went into it definitively saying that we're actually going to test a different couple models of governance. We're going to test a military model where it's hierarchical. And then we're also going to switch halfway through and build it on consensus building. And you can say those things, but they evolve organically regardless. Mm -hmm. And on every mission, you know, your group dynamic is different. You have to work very, very hard to build it. Even when you have a great crew, one that you are lifelong friends with, you have to work with attention to say, well, you know, how are we going to build that cohesion as a group? And um, one thing that we did at the beginning of that mission that was very helpful is we actually sat down and said, what are our success criteria? Mm. And then we compared notes. So we developed a shared model of what we thought success was. And so then in that way, you're kind of hitting the ground running because you're saying, well, this is where we disagree. This is where we mm -hmm. agree from the start. And then you can sort of start building that path together. Mm -hmm. um, so... In some respects, when you're trying to, you, you know, your job as a leader isn't to lead from the front, you know, yell at the troops, this is what you want, this is the results, why aren't you getting it? When I talk about leadership, I talk about leadership as a mortar between the bricks model. Hmm. Um, and the reason I call it that is when you look at a brick wall, it's so easy to think that the strength of that brick wall comes from the bricks themselves. But when you take away the mortar, if Without that mortar holding the wall together, there's no strength. That wall falls down. And so when I talk about leadership as a mortar between the bricks model, um, your job as a leader is to be that mortar to look for gaps that need to be filled, to fill those gaps, um, whether it's in your job description or not, mm -hmm. and to also forge relationships and connections between other parts of the team. And that's how you present yourself as a cohesive unit. So that's my approach to leadership. And hopefully it comes across in the missions, mm -hmm. um, you know, that I take part of whether I'm there as a leader in an official capacity, whether I'm a teammate, whether I'm practicing followership. Um, so that's, I think, the genesis of how I approach my leadership roles. So what can we learn from, from you? What can leaders learn from you? Can you give us a couple of examples as to how to behave properly as a leader? Here and down here on earth, in a corporation, in a company, when things get dense and difficult. Absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, to preface this, you know, for those who don't know me, my a lot of what I do is operational. I'm an emergency room physician. I've been in the OR, in the operating room. I've dealt with life or death situations. I've, fl I've, fl I've flown planes. I have my solo skydiving license. I'm an aquanaut diver. <laughs> I've been in all these ex austere environment expeditions. So I like to think that I know a little bit about austere environments, about operational environments, and about decision-making mm -hmm. um, as a leader and as the teammate. Um, so when we talk about principles of leadership, there are so many. And I think the first thing is to give yourself permission to just acknowledge um, what success looks like, what failure looks like, and more importantly, that these are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Because success isn't always pretty and success isn't always perfect. And they're from our every one of our successes, we still can debrief and learn lessons to either reinforce a pattern of performance that we'd like to replicate in the future. Um, or um, when we have suboptimal outcomes, there's still lessons to be learned. So whether you're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, a failure that wasn't, you know, and did not end up in the outcome that you wanted it to versus a success that wasn't optimal, the, the commonality is you're always learning and you're always trying to make yourself the better for the next time. So that's the first leadership lesson um, whenever I'm talking to anyone, whether it's, you know, students, whether it's talking to um, teams, corporate groups is, you know, you will fail. Um, and a, a friend of mine, she's a fighter pilot. She's one of Canada's seventh female fighter pilots. Hmm. And she says, if you've never failed, you're either lucky, lying or Jesus himself. So we all <laughs> fail. Right. And sort of how do you approach. And it's okay to fail. It's okay to fail. And you know, necessary. I It's yeah. necessary. And, you know, when I'm giving talks on this subject, I have an entire slide that says in big letters, it is okay to fail. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's so important to acknowledge that because when we think about success, when we talk about, you know, setting a goal, it's so many of us fall into this trap of thinking we go from point A to point B mm -hmm. that, you know, we set a goal, we work really, really hard, and then that's what success is. When in reality, it's a circuitous path of going two steps forward, three steps back, 10 steps forward, 15 steps mm -hmm. back. It is not a straight arrow. It is a very circuitous path. And managing our expectations is part of that 
knowing that we're going to deal with hardship. And then as we delve deeper into this journey of getting to success, how do we prepare ourselves for that hardship? When we talk about mental rehearsal, often we hear about visualization, the power of positive thinking, but we don't talk about rehearsing and preparing ourselves for the worst case scenarios. And we need to do that in order to be prepared for mm -hmm. anything we might face. And then to break that down a step further is not just overcoming, visualizing, overcoming difficult scenarios, but breaking it down so we have a step-by-step -step plan. Um, and then this actually really ties into your research around resilience, which for those who aren't familiar with the topic, it's like that stick to itiveness, that perseverance, that willingness to push on, even when the going's tough, whether you're performing really, really well and want to keep up that pattern of performance or whether you're at rock bottom. And so the research around resilience is the same things. It's, you know, mental rehearsal for the best and worst case scenarios. It's um, impulse control, resisting that urge to give up. It's uh, breaking things down, not so you're focusing on the end goal, but getting there step by step. And it's also that positive mm -hmm. self-talk saying, I've got this. And then result, you know, relying on your team saying that, you know, mm -hmm. my team's in my corner as well. Who can I get to help me with this problem? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Can we go back to the analog mission? Yes. Yeah, so we what, a little bit from that. And what was, was a typical day in, in that mission like? Yeah, so what we did... What was it good for, the, the mission, in, in the first place? So who, who was it done for? Yeah, so we went through an organization that organized um, analog missions. And for me, um, I had done two analog missions. I'd previously been to the Mars Desert Research Station. So for me, there were very specific things that I wanted out of this mission. And one was, you know, to... I'd been there twice as a crew medical officer in various, you know, underwater and Mars-like mm -hmm. environments. And I, I wanted to say, well, how will I perform as a leader based on lessons learned? Um, so for me, I wanted to test and hone my skills as a commander, um, as well as do it with a good set of people. And so this organization um, had been familiar with my work and they said, hey, we need a commander for this upcoming mission. Um, and so they asked me to step in. And one interesting thing and one lesson learned, um, I was asked to step in three weeks before the mission. <laughs> um, which, yeah, you're laughing because, and I, you know, in, in retrospect, I laughed too because, you know, uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into mission success. So you're being thrown into these team dynamics, very, very different backgrounds, um, very different expectations, different levels of familiarity with research, and you're trying to manage all that. Uh, you're trying to build that same mental model of success. You're trying to build cohesion. Um, and then you're also trying to deal with different stakeholders and their criteria for success, um, which may at times be um, cohesive to your own vision for success. Sometimes it may be competing. So then you're trying to constantly juggle that and manage those relationships um, and make sure that, you know, if there's disagreement, it's not negatively impacting the team from day to day. So that's the underlying basis with which we approach that mission. Um, and then from day to day, you know, we're, we have an operational schedule. We come in with the science. We come in with arts objectives. We come in with um, the overall mission objective, which in that case was the first station to station mission, mm -hmm. um, by which we mean in the simulation, we had established a brand new station on Mars. Um, and we were seeing how these two crews interacted, uh, how they functioned as their own. And then bringing it back to Earth, the realities of the discomfort of this is our generator failed in the mm. first few days. And then our solar panels, mm -hmm. which were supposed to be our backup, failed. So we were operating in complete heat uh, or in complete uh, darkness. Mm -hmm. Our electricity wasn't working. Um, our, our heat was going to start to fail in the middle of the desert in January. And then the second um, ten, the second station, which was a, was a tent, and it was a non-winterized tent mm. in the middle of the desert. Not good. Yeah, not good. And then sort of like, how do we, okay, this is what we have to work with. How do we safety-proof ourselves? Because the first mission objective that we established, then we all agreed on, was safety. It was safety, then science, um, and outreach, and then having a little bit of fun as mm -hmm. well. So fun was in there. It just wasn't the top priority. So then coming back to safety, it's sort of like, okay, well, you know, a very real risk is hypothermia. You know, how do we mitigate against that? Um, what supplies do we need to make a run for to make sure that this mission can be successful and safely successful. Um, so I guess, you know, the bigger lesson there is, you know, adapting and overcoming. Like you can't go into any operational scenario and expect it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Like no, no one who's been in an operational environment will describe to you a perfect scenario that they've ever had. Um, so, 
you have to expect that things are going to come up. And it's sort of like, how am I going to adapt to this? It's like it's like being on a gyroscope. Mm -hmm. You are constantly in motion. Mm -hmm. and you just need to constantly adapt your, your, mm -hmm. your balance so that you can adapt to what the situation needs. On a scale from one to ten, how ready are you, how ready are we to replicate that on Mars? As, as humans? Yeah. That's a great question. I think uh, as humans, it's hard to answer that question. Um, some are very ready. Uh, I think it depends on what your objectives are. Like if we wanted to send humans to Mars and we didn't care about survivability, we could launch tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? And then it's sort of like, well, what are your objectives? How much do you trust the habitat to be radiation proof? Um, how much do you trust your in-situ resource utilization and production? How much do you trust the fidelity of your life support system? Um, are you okay with a 98% closed loop life support mm -hmm. system versus a 99.9% .9 closed loop life support system? Um, how rigidly are you going to success? Uh, 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 how rigidly are you going to select mm -hmm. your crew? Because if you say anyone who wants to go to Mars, um, sometimes in operational environments or even you know on Survivor on TV, you say you see people who put themselves in these environments against adversity simply because they want to test their boundaries, mm -hmm. but they've never been in any type of survival scenario before. Sure. They've never prepared themselves for it. Um, so when you talk about how ready we are to go, some people have been preparing for this their entire lives. They are survivalists. They've been in austere mm -hmm. environments. Mm -hmm. They know how to be resourceful. They have that survival mentality. Some people could absolutely do it, mm -hmm. you know, today. Individually, Individually, but not as a team. As a team. There's certain yeah. teams who would have trained to do this. But as, as humans, if you were to say there's mm. an asteroid coming to Earth, the only mm. survival <laughs> option is to transport all of yeah. us to Mars. Yeah. Probably not ready as a species um, to take us out of our comfort zones mm -hmm. and put us into a place that's high, radi high radiation, 38% um, gravity, um, does not have a Starbucks in every corner. <laughs> like, like you have to go mm -hmm. through the mental thought experiment to to really understand what it means to take on a three to five year mission to Mars, to take on a one way trip to Mars. It is a six to nine month journey simply to get there with today's technologies. Right. And then once you're there, you will never step on grass again. No, you can't open the window. You're not going to. I mean, you can do anything once, yeah. but you only <laughs> could open that window once. Once, yeah. Um, you're... Um, so you're trapped inside a trailer. Y you are, right? And some people... For the rest of your life. Right. But some people can adapt to that, right? And sort of like, well, what are my goals? If you're mission focused and every day you're doing something to contribute to the mm. mission, uh, if you're doing something to make your crewmates' lives a little bit better, mm. then, you know, a three to five year mission is perfectly survivable. And there's people, you know, who do military deployments, mm. you know, for long term, mm. maybe 18 months at a time, mm. right? And, you know, who live on research ships mm. in the middle of the sea, right? And they, they're they used to that austerity. Um, and they have a routine for keeping themselves healthy and not just surviving, but thriving in that environment. Mm. So there are people um, who thrive in that kind of environment. And then interestingly enough, one of my areas of research is in psychology and resilience in austere environments. And there's this concept of salutogenesis. And what that means is the person who views austerity as an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to rise to the occasion. It's like, and views this as fulfilling. So there are people who have the mindset for whom a Mars mission, they would really, they would, they would get a lot out of it. It would be incredibly fulfilling, but they would also thrive in that environment. How about you personally? Would you go? It honestly depends on the mission parameters. Um, you know, if it's simply to be the first on Mars, but there's not much thought into the safety, the mission objectives, mm. the science, and it's simply for the glory, um, that doesn't interest me. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's like, if it's a, there's refined, defined objectives that I agree with and that you've run the engineering and the risks, there will always be mm -hmm. risk, but it's how have we acknowledged, mitigated and managed those risks? Um, what is the safety plan? Mm -hmm. You know, it, with the mm -hmm. right mission um, context, yeah, I would absolutely go. Yeah. Apart from the technical hurdles to make um, a habitat on, on Mars safe, what is, in your opinion, from working with teams, from le leading teams, what is the greatest issue? Especially when it comes to friction, human friction, where, where are we the issue as a human 
human species. Yeah. So within my experience in teams, I think it's acknowledging every single member of their team, knowing their strengths, knowing their weaknesses, knowing how they would like to be communicated with um, if something's gone wrong. You know, and these are discussions we've had on previous missions. Um, we would debrief at the end of the day. And then one thing that came up is um, some team members preferred to talk about um errors and issues in a group setting so we could all learn. Mm -hmm. And then there were some members who said, I find that personally like I'm being, you know, put on the spot, even though that's not the intent, I would rather you talk to me one on one about it. So finding the nuance of how each teammate needs to um, be integrated into the team to perform at their best. And you're always coming back to that principle of how do we optimize this team to perform, perform together and to meet our goals. Um, so that's kind of the approach that I've taken that, um, you know, has has have built up a lot. And then the other part of it is realizing that coming back to this concept of we're always going to make mistakes. Um, when you're a commander, when you're a leader, when you're a teacher, when you're a parent, you will make mistakes. And those mistakes are on display for everyone to see. And if you don't own up to it, you're going to lose trust. You're sure. going to lose respect. People are going to stop believing in you. And, you know, if you're in this little um, closed environment on a Mars simulation. You better deliver. Yeah, you're going to, you're going to mute, have mutiny on your hands. Yeah. Um, and there's going to be a variety of reasons people will disagree with you. Maybe, maybe they genuinely feel you're doing something unsafe, in which case, you know, that's a discussion that needs to be had. May have, maybe it's something about, you know, there's a personality conflict that isn't you know, someone just doesn't like, like the way you look that day. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen that play out too. And you always have to manage um, these things. Um, so when it comes to making a mistake, coming back to that point, you know, the way I find acknowledging is acknowledge the mistake, apologize for mm -hmm. it, say, I am sorry, like do it with integrity, but then also have a plan to make sure that that mm -hmm. doesn't happen or that you're prepared for it going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then if there's individual frictions, um, you know, in one expedition I'm planning, you know, it's it was the crew that we get along very well. Um, but there were things that need to be optimized. So we said, um, let's have an airing of grievances. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone said, well, that's that sounds kind of unproductive because it sounds like we're just kind of ragging on the mission and each other. Um, and then someone was saying, you know, somehow the analogy of sunscreen came in. We said, well, we're actually just sunburn proofing ourselves for future tent situations. So why don't we have a sunscreen session? So we're, um, you know, proofing ourselves against tough situations. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot more productive. So you can deal with friction points. And then if you approach it from the perspective of we're um, doing it to make sure that we're prepared the next mm -hmm. time we deal with a hurdle or face a hurdle, um, makes it a lot more focused and productive. Mm -hmm. um, is yeah. There, is there any research or insight on the type not only team size, but also, is it better to have mixed teams? Is it better to have all male teams, all female teams? Is yeah, there's there's a lot of research around that. One of my favorite books is called Humans in Space. Um, it's by Nick Canis. He's a psychologist. He's done lots of research on this. And um, interestingly enough, so there's research that says heterogeneous, like mixed gender crews are more productive. Mm -hmm. um, so I know, you know, when we talk about, you know, challenges of reproduction and sexuality in space, well, some people say, well, why don't you send a single gender um, crew to mm -hmm. Mars? Um, but we know productively that the heterogeneous, the mixed gender crews um, tend to tend to be more productive. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side, I once came across some research that said homogeneously cultural culturally homogeneous crews um tend there tends to be less conflict mm. and so that i brought brought that up to an astronaut friend once and he said yeah that's what the research says but i had a very mixed crew and these people are my brothers and sisters mm. and i would do anything for mm. them um and so you know you also have to you can acknowledge the research but you should also acknowledge like what the individual each crew dynamic is going to be individual to mm -hmm. that crew um, so there's a lot of research and it's really interesting because you can get really down into the weeds. Like when you looked at, look at mixed, mixed cultural crews, there's even research about what the preferred speaking distance is mm. between each crew. Mm. Some cultures, you know, speak very, very closely mm -hmm. that to you or me might be Uncom infringing, yeah. very mm -hmm. infringing on our comfort zone, whereas some people prefer distance. Mm -hmm. um, some cultures, you know, speak in a very authoritative, this is the plan kind of way. Some cultures don't respond to that. 
So being mindful that there's always going to be these factors and potential friction points, I think is the biggest takeaway from this and saying, see that, you know, this is a blind spot that I had when it comes to crew relations and leadership. Um, and if it becomes a friction point, acknowledge that, you know, it is a friction point and deal with it and move on. Would it make sense to bring happily married couples? I get, you know, I get asked that a lot and I've heard, I've heard um, pros and cons for and against this. I hear a lot of pros because, you know, when we talk about a long duration mission, bring a married couple mm. um, because, you know, then you're not, they're not missing their, their spouse um, back on earth. Um, you know, they're, they know how each other's works. Uh, sexuality is covered. Sexuality is covered. And then you have to ask the awkward question, well, what happens if they separate? <laughs> then, In space. Just, then it becomes awkward. Then it becomes a crew problem, right? Right. Um, and so there's, there's pros and cons against it. Um, so I, I think it's something that should definitely be explored, right? Because if you're both high-functioning astronaut candidate material, you are both made it into the astronaut core, and now you're being asked to go on a five-year mission. Um, ostensibly, you're good operationally, and then you're good interpersonally. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see it play out for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Sexuality in space, how, how does science answer the obvious question if you have mixed mixed teams how do you deal with affections for one another? Uh, I mean, like we're built as human beings yeah. to check out the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, do, you, do you medicate against that? Hormonal treatments to suppress, to suppress my interests? Yeah, there's, there's a million answers to that question. So some people say, well, only send um, single gender crews mm -hmm. for that reason. Well, then you might have a question like, what if, you know, someone says, I would like to explore a same-sex relationship sure. on Mars. Um, so then they say that they do that. There's no risk of pregnancy. But now, say it's a mixed culture crew and a very, very conservative culture is offended by this. And that creates crew friction. Mm -hmm. So you're not necessarily circumventing a problem by sending a single gender crew. Um, so then there's research that says, well, engineer the crew quarters on Mars for less privacy so that no one has an opportunity to fraternize. But then there's opposing research that says that... Um, uh, but the lack of privacy does not get rid of my human needs. It doesn't get rid yeah. of the needs and it actually um, makes crews less productive. Yeah. So then there, that's a problem as well. So then there's research that says, well, send only menopausal mm. females or, you know, people who've had vasectomy so mm -hmm. they can't get pregnant. Um, so then that answers one question, but what happens if the two people engaging in a relationship have been um, married back on Earth and now they're having an extramarital Martian affair, right? <laughs> and then this is a taxpayer-funded mission. Well, then what is the duty for the sponsoring agency sure. to inform the stakeholders and the taxpayers? So at any way you swing it, there's going to be conflict. Yeah. And th that's why it's so important, both within the confines of an agency-sponsored mission versus within the um, confines of a commercially funded mission. Like, we need to start asking these questions because can you mandate that everyone has to be on birth control? Can you mandate no fraternization? Mm -hmm. If someone does become pregnant, do you can you mandate a termination of that pregnancy where we would, you know, you know, we wouldn't do that mm -hmm. um, depending on the circumstance and the laws on earth. Um, and then, you know, if you go forward with that pregnancy, um, now you're saying, well, maybe someone, maybe the pregnant astronaut is going to take maternity leave. Mm -hmm. um, but now your life support system is working harder to mm -hmm. support an additional crew member. You're now feeding a crew of plus one. Um, or are you going to evacuate? What are the logistics of an increased G load of launch and landing mm -hmm. on a pregnant Astronaut. So, any way you swing it, there are so many considerations. Maybe we, maybe we're not meant to leave this place. Maybe we're <laughs> not. But this is where commercial um, astronautics and the commercial industry becomes yeah. really interesting because humans are innately competitive, and somebody always wants to be the first. Yeah. And so, even to date, if no one is taking credit for having um, had sexual relations in space. Someone will want to. Mm. Um, 
And someone will want to be the first to have had intercourse in space. Mm -hmm. Someone will want to be the first to have had conceived in space. Mm -hmm. Someone will first want baby in space. First baby in mm -hmm. space, right? These are all firsts. And to a certain degree, we can mandate, well, you're 36 weeks pregnant. You, We won't let you get on a transatlantic mm -hmm. flight. We won't get you go, let you get on space flight. Um, but one of the companies I advise is building the world's first space hotel. We, just as we can't mandate what people do and don't do in the privacy of their hotel rooms on Earth, we probably can't mandate what they do and don't do mm. in space hotels in orbit around Earth. So someone at some point is going to have relations um, in space. And we're even if we've been saying all along, we don't want to think about that, you know, space is this scientific, sterile, professional environment, mm. we're going to have to start thinking about it. But maybe it's also something that helps us come to terms with, with that topic here on Earth. Because it's it's still a topic we don't talk about uh, publicly. It's, we, it's it's very much under under the sheets. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sexuality. It's not a public yeah. thing to talk about. Uh, maybe in Europe it's a little better. Um, Netherlands, Austria, Germany. We're maybe a little more open minded. But I think what I hear is the the greatest porn industry is in the United States, and at the same at the same time. It's such an issue to talk about sexuality and, yeah. and, and the var variations of sexuality. Absolutely. And so I'm going to put my medical hat on for a second because I still practice clinically. I do a lot of women's health as well. And so one thing that changed my perspective um, about the way we view health was in second year medical school, I was introduced to the World Health Organization's definition of what it means to be healthy. And so many times when you think you're sick, I'm going to the doctor, but the WHO says being healthy is not merely the absence mm -hmm. of disease. It's the presence of physical, spiritual, psychological well-being. And I would add to that sexual well-being. And then where that comes into play is I do a lot of women's health and as of recently, a lot of men's health. And so many people are embarrassed and it is my job to let them know this is nothing to be embarrassed about. It is my job to be frank, upfront, and let them know we are here to help you solve a problem, no matter how sensitive it is, no matter how um, embarrassed they are about mm. rectal health, prostate mm. health, gynecological health. Um, and then what's really heartbreaking is culturally, for example, I come from a Southeast Asian culture mm. um, where, you know, we're not told about women's health. We're not mm -hmm. told about sexual health. We're mm -hmm. not told about mental health. These things are taboo. And literally, I've had conversations um, with um, women and men from all cultures. And for example, a woman will have a heavy, painful period and her doctor who's from a certain culture will say, well, I don't want to start you on birth control pills because that would make you promiscuous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely wrong. This is, you know, this is a medical issue. This is an option to treat your medical issue. And we need to take away the stigma um, to let you know that we're here to talk about this frankly in a way that helps you solve your problem. So when you're talking about how we need to open up conversations about sexuality in space, um, you're right. We need to come out from under the sheets on Earth as well. And if we come to it from a point of destigmatization and instead approach it about problem solving mm -hmm. with no embarrassment, um, you know, that is absolutely the most productive track to take. And so for anyone who's out there listening who might have felt stigmatized um, or too embarrassed to go to the doctor, this is my call to action for you to find a doctor who will put you at ease so that you're both on the same page when it comes to problem solving, because that is what our aim is in medicine. Because it's natural. It's, it's, it's natural. And it's also yeah. natural to have problems. Yeah. We're all going to have problems. Yeah. That's why doctors exist. Yeah. It's to help you solve those problems. Yeah. 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 Let's go back to that space hotel. Yeah. Um, when, when is it ready? Yeah, so, so when, when is it on booking.com? <laughs> a few years away yet. Um, so I have a medical advisor to Orbital Assembly Corporation. So this is the world's first artificial gravity um, rotating space hotel. Straight out of Space Odyssey 2001, simple physics, V squared over R um, gives you um, uh, partial uh, gravity. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of how fast so you spin. So it's that wheel, that yeah, it's a white wheel. wheel. Yeah. Yeah, so um, by the end of the decade, we will have um, stations in orbit. We have a plan towards uh, research platforms, both uncrewed and crewed. Um, and, you know, as we, our hope is to be a catalyst towards access to space um, for, you know, for exploration, for entertainment, for entrepreneurship, for science. There's so many, what excites me is when we give humans platforms, they take it and run mm. with it. We see that with social media, we yeah. see that with the app store. Yeah, yeah, but the app store, we yeah. see that with YouTube. And so space is the next great platform. And, you know, 
to be part of an organization, a company that's building that future in space is exciting. And then where, you know, the value add of, you know, talking about partial gravity is we have four billion years worth of evolutionary evidence that says we tend to, tend to do pretty good yeah. in 1G. Um, we have 60 years of human spaceflight data that says, well, there's some issues with microgravity, but we're still learning. Um, but the giant question mark comes when we ask about partial gravity. You know, mm -hmm. how do humans adapt to 17% gravity on the moon, 38% gravity on Mars? We just don't know. And the best way I've heard it phrased comes from Jim Logan. Um, he's a physician, former head of medical operations at Johnson Space Center. He said, what's the gravity prescription? How much gravity at what intervals for what duration and what mm. frequency do we need to make this work? Whether you're talking about development, reproduction, mm. whether you're talking about surviving and thriving on a different planet. Mm -hmm. I, I'd love to hear your take on what is going on right now in the space industry, because we have that first, we, have, we had that first phase, the pioneers back in the Apollo days. Then space sort of was on pause, was on standby for a couple of decades. And now it's coming back massively because it's becoming commercial. So, and, and it's now, you mentioned back in the day during the Apollo days, you had to be an athlete to be an astronaut. Today, it's different. Even handicapped people are considered becoming astronauts. And, and that's, of course, it's not only an interesting, I think it's necessary because I think space, no gravity doesn't care if you can walk or cannot walk. And so that's very interesting. So where do you see the state of humanity when it comes to becoming interplanetary? This is the most exciting time to be on the forefront of space exploration. Um, you know, as you were alluding to, this was once a part of a war. It was a show of technological superiority. Um, it wasn't about space. I think it was all about... You know, it yeah, was about, yeah. it was, you know, it was um, an extension of yeah. what was going on on Earth. It was yeah. a conflict between the U.S. and the Soviets. Yeah. And then over time, it became more about exploration, yeah. but it was still dominated by the big five, by Europe, Russia, um, Japan, Canada, NASA, the USA. Um, and then when we look at what has happened, you know, every few years, I make a diaspora um, of all the countries with space agencies. And, you know, in 2017, it was 70 plus. And then when I last revisited that in, you know, a year ago, it was 90 plus countries with space agencies. Mm. Um, because whether we're sending humans to space or not, having access to space is a superpower. It's a form of economic, economic development for infrastructure, for telecommunications, for monitoring um, our agricultural crop qualities and our soil, um, um, uh, quality as well. And so, you know, having a presence in space is part of the future. Um, now, extending that to human spaceflight and specifically commercial spaceflight, there was a first era, a golden era of human spaceflight with pioneers. Yes, with the flight of Gagarin, with the flight mm -hmm. of Shepard, um, with the um, with Apollo 11, um, with all of the Apollo missions. Um, this is a new golden age, because since 2021, we have hit this inflection point of exponential rise in access to space and democratization of access to space. Um, and it's been in that lag phrase for, for quite some time. We have all, those of us who watch the industry closely have been on the edge of our seats since the mid 2000s. Um, but in 2021, we saw Blue Origin mm -hmm. send civilians to space. We saw Virgin send Branson and his crew to space. We saw um, Inspiration4, the first all civilian crew go to space. And since then, it hasn't mm. stopped. Um, New Shepard has had more flights. You know, we've sent, you know, Wally Funk broke the record for the oldest person to space, 82. And then William Shatner, totally. you know, broke that record as a nonagenarian. Um, so now we're th changing, our, as you say, our perception of who goes to space. Um, this is continuing. Axiom sent up its Axe 1 mission. Um, it's continuing on with an Axe 2 mission. Um, SpaceX is following up Inspiration 4 with Polaris Dawn. So the, the you know, the, the number of missions isn't slowing down. 
And now we're saying, okay, what if space wasn't just for the pilots and the engineers and scientists? What if we could send other people to space? What if we sent the artists and the entrepreneurs and the athletes? What, could, what kind of sports can we do in microgravity? Well, what became of, of Elon's vision? He wanted to send artists around the moon. Yeah, so that is so the Dear, is that, is that still a thing? Dear Moon project is still a go. A you know, Steve Aoki is flying around the moon um, later this decade. You know that um, this that's a go. Eight artists are going to fly in cislunar orbit. Mm -hmm. um, so then, once upon a time, you know, coming back to this idea of who gets to go to space, um, it used to be the healthiest of the healthy. Mm. I used to say that being an astronaut was a bit of a medical genetic lottery as well, and the path towards becoming a governmental space agency astronaut is littered with the hopes and dreams of medically disqualified candidates. Colorblind, you're out. Uh, diabetes, you're out. You were iron deficient, you're out that year. Um, maybe you can come back in a future year. Um, you're pregnant that year, well, you're good this year, but you can't continue with the selection. <laughs> so there's any reason that you can be disqualified, and these are all true case studies I'm naming to you from previous NASA and Canadian Space Agency selections. And then someone somewhere said, what if? What if that didn't have to be the case, depending on the mission profile? Um, Stephen Hawking flew zero G in parabolic flight in 2007, mm. and he, he loved it. You just mm. need to see the image of you know, his expression. Um, and so then since then, you know, with suborbital flight, with the flight profile, we initially had centrifuge studies that backed up medically that folks from 18 to 89, folks with insulin pumps, folks with congenital heart defects who've had um, heart surgery, they all did well in these increased G profiles that mimicked a suborbital um, uh, accelerated G profile, six Gs front to back. People did well. And the most common reason someone would be disqualified was um, claustrophobia, mm -hmm. anxiety, having a panic attack, panic attack, not doing something safe or simply being unwilling to follow directions. So now that changes the profile because you're kind of looking from a medical risk standpoint, you're looking at what is the probability that something bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And in the context of suborbital flight from start to finish, it's not very high. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to have a medical issue en route on a transatlantic mm -hmm. flight, which is much longer. Mm -hmm. So then that de, um, that stratifies risk and says, well, you know, suborbital flight is probably safe for most people um, with certain qualifiers. So then we extend that further and say, you know, how does that translate to orbital flight? Um, and the inspiration for a crew is all said very publicly, if this were a NASA selection, we would have been medically screened out. Mm -hmm. um, but they still, you know, thrived for their several day mission on orbit. Um, you know, I don't know the medical profiles of who went on the AXE missions. Um, but again, you know, these are not your typical astronauts from a NASA or a Canadian Space Agency or ESA perspective. So to take that even a step further, then what about people who typically wouldn't have even been able to apply? Um, those with physical disabilities, with amputations. And the European Space Agency did something momentous with its last selection. Mm -hmm. They issued the first ever call for para-astronauts, those mm -hmm. with lower limb um, disabilities, amputations, limb length uh, mm -hmm. discrepancies. Because as you say, in zero G, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so they announced their first ever um, astronaut, para-astronaut, with, along with their selection this year. Um, and, you know, his credentials are amazing. He's a Paralympian. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He's a researcher. Like, he puts the rest of us to shame. And so then, you know, it's, it's this question of saying, well, what if? If this person can do it, what if we can bring more with us? And mm -hmm. then we see the rise of the Astro Access Initiatives to they've flown two campaigns now with folks who have um, uh, visual disabilities, hearing impairments, uh, mobility issues, who might be paraplegic. And they've flown successfully mm. on parabolic flight. And now to take it in step even further to build on these successes, um, I've had the privilege to become involved with the Norwegian Next Steps Initiative. And this is the world's first commercial para-astronaut initiative. Mm. And if you look at the candidates, they are the best of the best. They are Paralympians, they're formal, former Norwegian Special Forces Police. Mm -hmm. um, they have mobility. Um, disabilities, but, you know, their credentials are amazing. And, you know, to be a part of this journey to help increase, to help catalyze this access to space um, is so exciting. And then on the other end of it, 
coming back to the concept of what happens when you give humans platforms in mm. which to perform, microgravity and space being another one of them, what happens when you manufacture? What happens when you get creative? What happens when you send anyone or at least make access easier? What can we create? Mm -hmm. I think that's what really excites me about the future of the democratization of access to space. That's the beautiful part, democratizing societies, because here on Earth, we are, we're siloed in, in we, we have people with disabilities, they're excluded from most of the things we, we do on Earth. But this gives us, or many different groups of society, a, a new start to become a new part of societies. And this is, that's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful idea to, to consider. What are the parts that are the tricky nuts we need to crack still, if on our way towards becoming that, I think interplanetary is still too far away, but becoming a species that settles down on the moon in the near future, what are the problems we need to take care of? Yeah, the question always comes down to contextualization and nuance. What are we trying to achieve and what are the risks involved um, in this particular mission profile? Um, so coming back to my own field of expertise in space medicine, when we talk about how we frame the challenges of exploration class in deep space missions, we talk about the RIDGE framework. So we talk about increased radiation, isolation, confinement, distance from Earth, altered gravity, and everything else which falls under hostile environments, including lunar dust exposure, um, altered day-night cycles. So your lunar day-night cycle um, at uh, on the moon's equator is 14 days of day, 14 days of night. Mm -hmm. And we know from the Apollo missions that the lunar regolith they encountered was a very potent skin, mm -hmm. uh, ocular respiratory mm -hmm. irritant. How do we mitigate those? Um, going a step further, talking about distance from Earth, light, even traveling at the speed of light, telecommunications can only travel so fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, depending on the alignment of Earth and Mars, you might be waiting 46 minutes to say hi, hello, and have that interaction. So then if you are a crew on Mars and you have a medical emergency and say it's your doctor mm -hmm. that's incapacitated, mm -hmm. who has a cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. you absolutely cannot wait 46 minutes um, for a return call from Earth to say, please start mm -hmm. chest compressions because mm -hmm. by then the window sure. is passed. Um, so then our challenges going forward, um, you know, are doing it in a stepwise fashion that is safe, that is scientifically sound, and that has a view towards progress and inclusivity. Mm -hmm. um, how do we manage that risk? How do we um, expand the, the avenues towards space? Um, how do we do it in a way that's sustainable? You know, if we're serious about the Artemis missions, mm -hmm. um, creating a permanent off-world sustainable presence, permanent exploratory surface operations on the moon, what stepwise fashion do we build that up in? Um, how do we build up the medical infrastructure mm -hmm. to support that? Um, what does a trauma bay on Mars look like? Mm -hmm. You know, these are these are the questions that keep me up at night. Um, so just th the one line summary is, you know, come back to your first principles of what your objectives are and then figure out how you do it safely, scientifically mm -hmm. and inclusively. From an evolutionary perspective, do you think we would take a different route as a species once we are exposing ourselves to that new environment? So is there epigenetics going on? What, would we grow different limbs or what? Or, or? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if we would um, develop more limbs in space, but that's a very important question to ask because if we're going as a sur survival prerogative, um, and then we say, you know, say somehow the science is advanced and we've proven that we can reproduce in altered G environments and that someone, you know, can successfully start a family on the moon. But it just means that they're a little bit taller and their bones are a little bit less um, adapted to G loads. Um, maybe it means they can't return to Earth. Um, so then we're suddenly begin to, beginning to evolutionary diverge. And maybe you won't see that in the first generation. Maybe you look alike enough to a human and you're adapted enough still to 1G that your offspring first generation on the moon can still come back to Earth, can still reproduce with humans born on Earth. But then maybe it's cumulative over generations between adaptation to an altered G environment, uh, exposure to increased radiation, and then maybe over time um, we're creating a divergent 
humanity that is taller mm -hmm. and can jump higher but cannot adapt to the 1G environment. Um, and maybe you don't see it immediately, but maybe you see it over time. And then there comes a philosophical question that if there's enough divergences, at what point do you start calling that a different species? Absolutely. Yeah, so it's... I think there's an answer to it from an evolutionary uh, perspective, uh, a scientific answer. I think a species has a very clear boundary to the other species. I think it's it's about procreation, if I'm not mistaken. It, it is, yeah. and then, you know, that is the hard and fast scientific rule, and then you hear these anecdotes from the animal kingdom all the time where you hear these species that were not supposed to be able to mate yeah. have come back yeah. and mated. Yeah. So it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, so it, it does, you know, there, there it does bear questions because even if we're using that as the hard and fast rule, saying that, you know, six generations down, a sixth generation lunar being can no longer procreate with a human, a, a Terran human. Well, what about the fifth generation? Wow. Did that divergence happen somewhere between generations five and six? Fascinating. Fascinating to think about. Huh. This, um, again, I'm, I'm asking a question as to if it's a good idea to leave, to leave our planet because we're opening Buckets of worms, not cans of worms. There's, there, I think it's there's just two imperatives in answer to that question. The first one is a survival imperative. And there's that there's that joke that if you're in the space industry, you've heard that the dinosaurs didn't have a space program. Yeah. Where are they now? Right. So you can't <laughs> right now we have eight yeah. billion eggs in yeah. one Terran basket here yeah. on Earth. Um, so there's a survival imperative to, you know, spread humans across the universe. Um, but then it's also, I think, a fundamental question of what it means to be human. We ask, what if? What happens if I do this? What happens if I explore there? Well, now that I've been there, what if I go a step mm. further? You know, that's what, that's how we've gotten to where we are. Mm. Someone said, what if I, you know, construct this? What if I build a wheel? What if I uh, eat this plant? What if I extract this medication from this plant? This, the, what if I purify it? That's how aspirin mm -hmm. came from the willow bark, mm -hmm. right? That's how we discover things. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think, it, you know, that being a fundamental human trait, I don't think we're going to stop exploring. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, just the survival imperative hopefully will propel us to do that sooner rather than later. Hmm. As a physician, do you advise against or pro procreation in space? Should we have kids in space? We should do it in a way that is ethically and scientifically sound and safe. And so, um, you know, Egbert will tell you with Spaceborn, the initial proposal of the company was to take a woman in her third trimester and induce labor um, in low Earth orbit to have the first mm. off-world birth. And as a physician who's seen things gone horribly wrong in low risk, mm. in air quote, labors on Earth, you might lose the heartbeat. You might have to perform a crash C-section. You might have mm. to do a, um, a forceps delivery. You might have to repair a bad tear. You might have to do, uh, you might have a mass hemorrhage and need to transfuse many units. Hopefully this is getting people's hearts racing with anxiety because now imagine doing that in low earth orbit. You don't want to do that. So then, um, you know, Spaceborne, now what they're doing is much more stepwise, crawl, walk, run, fly, um, proposing starting with research on embryos and how they um, respond to the spaceflight environment. I think that's a much more sound um, and safe and ethical way to do it. And so when, you know, at some point a human is going to be born off Earth um, and hopefully what we've done and what we've compelled to do people to do with our calls for more action on research and reproduction and sexuality in Earth has helped build up that base of research so we're not caught unawares mm. when the first human in space is born. By then, we'll have funded much more of these studies which have already happened with embryos, with salamanders, with jellyfish, mm. um, with zebrafish in mm. space, and we'll you know have sorted out all of this conflicting data on there's increased uh, death amongst offspring. There's increased issues with development. No, there isn't. Like there's so much data out there from shuttle, from Skylab, from mm. Mir that's conflicting that we need to sort out. And so, yes, at some point, humans are going to procreate in space. But if we know from the magnitude of data that it cannot happen safely without a high risk of birth defects in the zero-G environment, then maybe let's 
dial it back a bit and say, well, what if we start with experiments in 0.5G, in one third G? And, you know, if one third G works, what mm. about one six G? Mm. Um, so that's what I mean by approaching. Slowly dialing it up. Yeah, approaching mm. this in a stepwise, mm. scientific, safe manner. Hmm. What up next for you, for Shauna, in professionally? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I am continuing my austere environment work. I have a few mm. expeditions to announce um, over the coming months. Um, very excited to be part of those. Um, continuing with the research that we're doing for um, space medicine, we I'm part of a research group that has uh, will be flying a pupilometer aboard the Polaris Dawn missions mm. um, with SpaceX. So very excited about that. Um, have a few payloads um, related to manufacturing in space, building foam in space. Uh, that's a student payload. And then hopefully getting to space myself Great. soon. So you ready for it? I, uh, I was ready yesterday. <laughs> and then um, beyond that, contributing to medical infrastructure in deep space in a meaningful way that leaves a legacy for generations to come. And then bringing those medical advances to our most remote, rural and resource limited locales on Earth. Hmm. Fascinating. For that long, boring journey ahead of you, what tune for a Spotify playlist would you want to bring along? The one tune, uh, by the way, we do have that Spotify playlist. So I started it like a couple of months ago. Okay. And there's a Spotify playlist for the future space traveler. Wonderful. And so I'm asking you, which tune should I introduce to that playlist? Okay, so it's a little bit cliche. There's two cliches on there. Um, so you definitely need To the Moon and Back by Savage Garden, mm -hmm. because that, you know, if you're going to the moon, you need that song. Um, Black Holes and Revelations, Starlight by Muse, very fitting. Um, and then if you just want a non-space, but masterpiece of um, rock, of music, of alt rock. Um, my favorite band of all time is Linkin Park and they remixed their first album and they called it Reanimation and it is a masterpiece. It's something that needs to be listened to from start to finish. And it is a 90 minute journey of just um, audio um, prowess. It is, it is very immersive. So that's something I've listened to over and over from start to finish and I think would be perfect for a long duration nice. space journey. Wonderful. Um, the show is called the Space Cafe Podcast. It's a coffee place. And you go to coffee places now and tend to have an espresso to energize yourself because you're tired, you want more energy. So why don't you share an espresso for the mind with us, with me, with the audience, to energize our minds, inspiration. You can pick whatever kind of topic you want to pick. I think my shot of espresso, hopefully it's a double shot of espresso, is this is the time to be involved with space. Even if you thought that your particular journey doesn't have a space in place, maybe you're a storyteller, we still need you. Um, so look at the trajectory of space. Think about what we've discussed today. Think about what you want space exploration to look like in 2025, 2030, 2050, and then figure out what role you wanna have in, in that journey and how you're gonna architect that future of space, because you absolutely have a place in space. It's up to you to realize that journey. Shana, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. It's extremely interesting to chat with you. So you're such a great communicator. <laughs> thank you wow. So much. Wow. That was fun. Thank you, my friends, for joining us on this fascinating and inspiring episode of the Space Cafe podcast. Our guest, Shauna Pandya, has given us a unique perspective on space medicine, the challenges of long duration space travel, and the ethical implications of human reproduction in space. As we look toward the future of space exploration, it's clear that individuals from all backgrounds have a role to play in shaping this exciting new frontier. So whether you're a scientist, an engineer, a storyteller, or simply someone who dreams of the stars, remember that you have a place in space. Don't forget to follow our Spotify playlist for future space travelers curated by our guests, favorite tunes, and 
Be sure to subscribe to the Space Cafe podcast for more engaging conversations on the latest developments in space, science, and technology. Once again, thank you, Dr. Shauna Pandya, for sharing her insights and experiences with us. This is your host, Marcus, signing off until our next cosmic adventure. Stay curious, my friends. Stay inspired and keep reaching for the stars. Bye-bye. Thank you.